go. Hey, everybody. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning to wherever you may be in this world, in the global space, and also known as the NFT space. Um, today, we actually have like a really special guest. We, you guys might know him from the Wagme Studios. He's here to tell us about a project he's been working on called Fat Cats. Uh, Dylan, how are you doing, brother? Hey, dude, thanks for having me on. And uh, yeah, I think it's always good morning, right? I mean, if I've learned anything from being uh, working with tech people in, in LA, it's always good morning because everything is in PST. Yeah. So. <laughs> Did you ever see the, the Truman Show? It's a movie? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so yeah. it reminds me of that whenever I say that because he like looks and he's like, and if I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, you know, like it, it makes me think I'm like, you know, on the Truman Show for something. It's kind of funny, <laughs> but yeah, I guess uh, it's kind of like Aloha, you know, Aloha could be uh, hello or goodbye, you know. Yeah, and 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 I started doing in Second Life because I was involved in so much role play. I started doing greetings, you know, and, and but then it started sounding like, oh come on, Dylan, you know, you're not sixty five, even yeah. if I've got that. <laughs> my profile pic you're not in an mmorpg come on dylan yeah <laughs> <laughs> but anyways yeah like um what i like to do on the amas whenever i have people come on here is i give them a chance to you know just pretend that you know there's people in the crowd that have never heard about their project and they may have won a whitelist and they're trying to decide whether or not they want to mint and so could you just give like a kind of a I call it an elevator pitch, but, you know, just a brief little intro of like some of the really interesting points and why, like, you know, Fat Cats is different than other projects out there. Yeah, sure. You know, if I could if I could do a background on myself self first, I think that would give a lot of context. Yeah, is that absolutely. OK? Absolutely. Yeah. Hell yeah. Super. OK, so I came from the world of private banking, uh, offshore trusts and particularly working with high net worth individuals and family offices. Uh, and I did that for a couple of years. Uh, and then the writing was on the wall. I remember kind of distinctly when Singapore and Zurich banks were like, uh, please bring us your sheikhs and your oligarchs, but tell your Americans we can't open accounts for them anymore. And I'm like, no, no, no screw this. I, I don't like traveling that much anyway. I'm a little bit tired of back and forth to Manhattan and Zurich anyway. So let me pivot. And I pivoted to fine art consulting and worked a lot with Sotheby's, Christie's, Bonhams and Julie. And I come from a family that's heavily involved in that world. Uh, my first cousin is Kelly Hoppen, and she's a very well-known interior decorator in England. So I just had those contexts and I, I, I felt like I've always been a lifelong collector, uh, going with my mother already at the age of nine to Sotheby's and you know, being a Magic the Gathering judge around 11, 12. So awesome. it was just a great opportunity for me. Um, and so I did that for seven and a half years and it also allowed me to work from home. And so during that whole time period, uh, I found myself kind of hanging out in Second Life uh, because I'm, I'm definitely an amateur historical nut. And so being able to do kind of cosplay without having to meet everyone, you know, for these expensive trips and, and only for a few days, it was just this fantastic idea. And, you know, for anyone who has tried kind of paragraph role play, uh, you've either got to meet, you know, in person, right, for like Vampire the Masquerade kind of thing. Or you have to do it as like a forum, like a Discord and, and write it out. And so the happy medium in between was something like Second Life. And we had this massive island, similar to what NFT Worlds has, but much higher graphics. Uh, and we had about 450 active members for a couple of years. Uh, and I did that. And during that whole period, you know, I became very, very comfortable with digital assets and collecting online. Uh, so much so that it was just kind of I had this epiphany one day. It was like, wow, I have 90,000 items and I'm buying and selling, you know, first editions of Disney collectors and stuff, Disney creators and Warner Brother creators now in Second Life. Uh, I don't know if I want all of my porcelain and collectibles anymore. They need insurance. They need to be packed away. They need to be transported. And kind of no one really meets anymore in the world like we used to, right? If you go to auction houses, no one's buying big dinner tables and silver anymore uh, because that's not how we socialize anymore. Uh, and so I became very comfortable with that. And I remember distinctly, you know, I'd been in cryptos and Silk Roads uh, I remember joking with a friend recently that, um, you know, I said, Ollie, you know, those lollipops that we were buying with, the, you know, for the prime minister's son, because he used to come and <laughs> hang out with us in Jerusalem. Uh, those were $15,000 a lick, just saying, you know, so, uh, you know, that's how early I was in crypto, uh, very much because I'm a lifelong libertarian. But I, I didn't give crypto as much uh, importance as I think a lot of my friends did, just because I wanted to see more utility. I like to consider myself a lifelong value investor. And so, you know, waiting for that utility was really important. And when NFTs came around, you know, I was all in. I mean, I, I literally kind of quit the rest of my job and ran, came running, especially after listening to the person who bought the Beeple for 60 million. 
Um, you know, they he kind of sorry. Yeah, I was just saying it's crazy that, that people for sixty million. It's amazing. Yeah, and 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 that kind of I heard it and I was like, you know, impressed because I was again I'm part of that world, right? Like, you know, crypto punks. You know, a lot of people are like, what the hell is crypto punks? I was already impressed because Sotheby's had onboarded them, right? When Sotheby's onboards them, it means there's enough of their one percent clientele that are taking this as a novel market seriously. And so when the people sold for sixty million, I was already kind of grounded into the idea. Uh, of it being okay. But the part that really made me like run as fast as I could was this guy finally came out of the closet a month later. He came on a number of AMAs. Uh, and it was literally this young Indian guy who giggles over there saying, you know, I was a chaiwala, uh, the coffee maker for telecommunications company. And now I've got 250 million. And, they, and then the next part is very interesting. They're like, okay, well, what are you buying now, right? You're buying these beeples and these archaeological art pieces. What else are you buying? He's like, oh, we've just started buying up a lot of real estate. And they said, oh, cool, in New York. I mean, he said, no, in Decentraland. And I'm like, what the fuck is Decentraland? <laughs> so I went running to Decentraland. Uh, and I was not that, imp I was impressed with the concept. But I was concerned that this is not the metaverse renaissance we needed because no one was there, right? Everyone was speculating on property, but no one was using it yet because it's pretty damn ugly, right? Uh, and so instead, I went to Upland, uh, you know, where I met Teddy Pig and a bunch of other people listening here today. And that was much more of a niche metaverse platform. And uh, yeah, I made really a killing over there. I was doing kind of brokerage for some of my whales and dolphin friends. Uh, and before I knew it, I heard that uh, Mirandus and Illuvium were opening up. And when the Flare Network and Polyon Vaults bought Citadels for $3.5 million, that was just very substantial to me. That was like, okay, you know, we may not be having Blizzard and Epic Games here yet, but this is a hell of a lot more advanced than CryptoKitties. Uh, and so I founded Crown Capital. Uh, and before I knew it, you know, we had 1.4 million under management, literally with no marketing or anything. I mean, just a bunch of friends came together. Uh, and we'd bought into six of these games. And I remember distinctly around, I think it was October time that we started having the debate of, you know, what kind of nouveau rich corporation would we be if we don't also have some art? And then that got into this major debate and we roped in Giancarlo and we roped in kind of uh, Kieran of Illuvium and a bunch of other people. We started speaking to them about, you know, are we at the point where NFTs are forming into different asset classes? And long story short, we said, yes. There's kind of like four different classes. There are NFTs, which have obvious utility, like a sniping bot. There are, and, and maybe kind of we can throw into that kind of the Kevin Rose idea of, you know, a winery that's got only 5,000 memberships, making that token gate and putting on an open sea so that they can kind of get the royalties for events, but the members can kind of use the free market to bid on who wants that. So, you know, that's the obvious utility NFTs. Then you have metaverse platforms, which are, again, primarily a social platform with, you know, maybe some mini games. Then you have the NFT play to earn games, which are, again, primary a, a, a massive game like World of Warcraft, but maybe also having a Travis Scott concert on the side. And then you have what I call the blue chip NFTs. And I now actually say blue chip NFT brands because I want people to start looking at them like that. You know, when we say this paradigm that 1% will survive and 99% will fail, it's only if they're trying to be Nike, Coca-Cola, Gucci, or something of that level, right? Where, they, where the art is turned into iconic brand use. But there can be lots of little NFT projects, lots of little boutique utility that I think will survive. But that's not what, you know, when we're looking at these, all these projects coming out that are essentially mostly just JPEGs, trying to find that 1% that is going to be uh, impressive brands, you know, get to the point where it's like got already brand awareness, like a bored ape. You know, as I said to the ape-less people, you know, from talking to all of my friends, and I don't kind of walk around with a hoodie, so, but talking to all of my friends who had their bored apes and were walking around with hoodies, uh, if you're in one of the major cities, someone is going to come over to you and start a conversation or, or honk at you. That to me is very, very valuable. You know, for anyone who's watched Mad Men or The Devil Wears Prada, that's a really kind of brand recognition uh, that's one in a million. Uh, and so that's what we felt was needed. And we, we decided that, you know, look, crowd capital is going to focus on play to earn games. Let's take all of our governance, legal structure, legal team, and everything we've got there and spin off a sister DAO called Fat Cats. And that's how we got here. So that's kind of my background. And then I can kind of give you the cliff notes on Fat Cats if you like. Yeah, I love that, um, you know, the background that you just gave on. It's a way more in depth than you know, most people, and um, I must applaud you for being very well-spoken, honestly, um, which is actually just such, like, a privilege to, like, have that, because most people come in here and, 
kind of ums, uhs, don't know really what to say. So it was a great background. And it's really interesting, actually. It gave me like, you know, I, I was like kind of thinking about that Christie stuff and, you know, with that people and all that kind of stuff. And I was like really interested on like why, you know, they decided to, to go with that. And, and when you brought up the whole the interest of their 1%, it kind of is like a really interesting concept to like think about like, you know, of all the people that are, you know, kind of run that, um, you know, that make sure that people are, you know, getting all that really expensive. I mean, the you know, the rich people, you know, the, of the one percenters of the world and the one percenters of the of Christie's is super interesting. Yeah, they love it. They love it, man. I mean, if anyone hasn't seen this yet, please do yourself a favor and Google um, the Bansky balloon, uh, the Bansky um, balloon go auction. And, you know, this was one of my favorite art history moments. Uh, Bansky had this, you know, Bansky does this kind of street art, right? Like uh, the trying most to... famous street artist probably currently, yeah. you know, uh, I would yeah. say that maybe Keith Haring is is the pioneer of it. If you know, um, for, it depends on exactly. how old you are, you know, Keith Haring, I'm a huge fan of street art and before i came to the nft space sorry to kind of cut you off but i think it's a really oh, relevant thing you. is before i came to the nft space i collected street art and gig posters and um movie posters by like famous artists and i have a collection in my house i never had the privilege to own a banksy because those are you know several thousand dollars um and, and just impossible to get but yeah I have to show you something that's, if we're going on a tangent, I have to show you something that Street Labs did for us. Um, they, street Labs is, is doing, is trying to on, like be a platform to onboard street artists. And, um, and so they did this, they did this one-on-one -on -one for us. Um, let me post it in. If I post a link, will I get in voice chat? Will it work? It, Let's try. It does oh, there we go. Yeah. Look in voice chat, everyone. So that's a Mexican street artist. Uh, who took one of our items and, and put it as a one-on-one -on -one in their collection. Uh, but yeah, Bansky's amazing. And, um, and so he had this thing called the girl with the, the balloon girl, right? It's like this girl holding a balloon and it's in this massive gilt frame, right? Like an oversized, almost like, like, you know, this is fine art, right? That's how kind of Christie's pitched it, right? They're, you know, like it's taking the piss of fine art. What they didn't realize was that Bansky had booby trapped it. And so midway through the auction, they're like, and we, you know, and they got to 2 million, the gavel hits, and then the painting <laughs> literally started to shred itself. It's incredible. I mean, it was the most unbelievable moment. I mean, before that, I think my favorite moment in art history was when the pink diamond sold at Sotheby's in, in Geneva uh, for 60 million. At the end of the auction, everyone's clapping and they played the Pink Panther. You know, they take, they love to have kind of this like pageantry, but that was the best thing. Anyway, the follow up with that was even better. They, they like, they called the client. They're like, we're so sorry. Oh my God, you don't have to buy it. You know, we've got insurance. Don't worry. He's like, are you kidding me? I for sure want that painting. And if you don't give me that painting, I'm going to see you. It was just the, the, the whole thing was just like, you know, shows you kind of, you know, DJing culture. I mean, it's not new with us, right? Like, look at the gala. Look at the, the how some of these kind of top, actresses and stuff go to the gala dinners right like they they that culture of that one percent it's it's the hunger games right in many ways and so they loved crypto punks i mean they loved you know putting it on the wall like digitally in a way you know with like a screen with a certain pixel count and they just love that kind of stuff so um you know that grounded me into it because once they saying you know it's reached kind of a critical mass where this is a movement then it is a movement, right? You know, people often don't realize this, but, you know, Christie's and Sotheby's are gatekeepers, right? As much as, you know, the OG collections, when they bring up NFT projects are gatekeepers, they are literally gatekeepers. You know, if an artist gets into one of their specialized, you know, modern art galleries or collections, they've pretty much made it. Yeah. I, I, I just, sorry, I was, I was, uh, I just linked the, the, the um, video of the shredding and the reaction, the reaction to the uh, the people, there's like this girl that's on her phone, just like staring at it. No one else is looking and it just starts shredding. And then people are just like gasping. It's like, what's going on? Oh my God. Still there, Dylan? Yes, yes. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. It never gets old. It never gets old. <laughs> that girl, the 
the the woman on her phone that's just right underneath it, just staring at it, and then it just starts shredding out. And she's just like, oh god, <laughs> they're all freaking out. The guy on the phone and in the suit is hilarious. The, the most the most crazy passionate collectors I've ever met in in my in my life, as a general rule, are are collectors of antiquities. Mm -hmm. I mean, that whole market is literally. I mean, people kill. You know. It's, uh the the plunderers you know my uh he's he's now been arrested but but i you know i did a bit of work for a client oh well, no he settled with him he's not in jail he settled but he was he was pillaging idols from all of these different gray these dig sites i mean you know like the, he was bribing the archaeologists and he had this kind of you know house filled with all of these museum grade uh idols i mean you know from like early can 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 canaanite history and egyptian history and it was it was bizarre, you know, it was like Victorian era, right? Because I was like, kind of like all these lords would go to Egypt and go, how wonderful, how lovely. Let's just bring it back to our garden and stick it in our homes. Yes. You know, and, whoops. That's outside. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, yeah, the, the art world is weird and wonderful and fascinating. Uh, and very much, you know, we, you know, all these people like laugh at people who say they've got a board ape as a flex. Oh, yes. I mean, it's not, not new, right? Every, every Marilyn Monroe and onwards wanted a five-carat diamond on her, ring, on her finger. And every, every lad in America from the 70s and on wanted a Rolex. Uh, and if they had more class, they wanted a Patek Philippe, right? So we're not the first people, you know, to pay for a flex. Yeah, I mean, it's, I always tell people it's like, you know, you, you can buy a Lamborghini and get from point A to point B, or you could buy a used car, used Toyota Camry and get from point A to point B exact same way. Why do they do it? Exactly. For the flex. But, but does it have a massage chair? Does it have a <laughs> massage chair? Does it, have, <laughs> does it have six TVs inside the car somewhere? <laughs> exactly, so exactly. Funny. Cool. Okay, so let me, uh, let me give the kind of cliff notes on Fat Cats. So uh, I like to break down Fat Cats into kind of, you know, I, I, I hate to say this, but, you know, under promise and over deliver, I, 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 think, I think I mean it. I really do. And so roadmap version one, the three kind of core principles are the tangible, which is we're literally building a uh, blue chip hedge fund structured as an investors club. Uh, and if anyone wants to kind of take a deep dive into our governance, we've got a light paper. Uh, and we also have really a great legal team that are helping us set up British Virgin Island trusts and stuff after the mint. If people want to know why after the mint, it's got to do with the settler law, right? Like if we were to mint it, if we were to settle a offshore trust now, then it would be uh, by, via consensus. Whereas if we don't, then it's not via consensus. And that kind of gives us extra protection. We can go into that legal mental masturbation if anyone wants later with pleasure. But anyway, the core offering is a blue chip hedge fund structured as a collector's club. 70% of the mint and 100% of the royalties. And then for the junior fat cats, which is essentially just a stock split, uh, just kind of to help with unique hold account. And, you know, because we're not a high project, we do want another entry point for other people. So in that case, 100% of the mint and 100% of the royalties uh, go to the DAO. Uh, and then our purpose is to invest in blue chip NFTs, whatever the hell that means, uh, which we kind of tried to break down into big caps, mid caps, and small caps. So big caps are those that have kind of reached a certain critical mass, have been around for a while, have teams that seem to be doing what they promised. Um, mid caps are those that maybe gone under the radar, um, you know, and then, you know, maybe something's wrong over there and is it systemically wrong or can it be fixed? Cool Cats is a good example. Uh, Subducks, Kuhlman's Universe, maybe something like Enigma Economy that's high utility, but really not doing much marketing. And then we've got the small caps. How do we find the next PXN? What do we do with that information? Do we give 10 white list spots to, to the Dow Treasury, for example? Do we sell some and then maybe buy back later once they've proven things? Uh, and then also incubation, right? Or, you know, this is where you and I talk so much, Zero Cool, right? Like if we can find a project that is maybe missing a few elements, but has so much genuine uniqueness, novelty, uh, innovation, uh, let's help them go the rest of the way. And in so doing, kind of get a lot of stuff for our community and maybe even some money for the treasury, right? Royalties are not going to continue like they are forever. And so, you know, communities that are thinking long term should be looking for income models. So that's how we kind of break down the fund. Um, and then from a governance point of view, uh, we have, we break things down into 
you know, DAOs are also such a dirty word, such a dirty, dirty word. I'm so sorry for swearing at your audience, but uh, we do have a DAO. Uh, but I like to think of DAOs as an upgrade. DAOs on more like a broken corporate. record, you know. You know, like yeah, says, yeah, DAO, it's, it's, DAO. Uh, what's your roadmap? Yeah, Merchandise marketing... and DAO? No shit. <laughs> <laughs> once marketing teams get hold of it and get to do their work, it becomes a very, you know, dirty, dirty word. But, you know, we could have a three-hour conversation on governance if you wanted to. Uh, you know, we can. But, I, you know, there's, for, for those who are old enough to remember, we had such things called protocol DAOs. And those are DAOs, you know, like the Ethereum chain and stuff where everything is by contract consensus, right? What I think we mean now when we're talking about community DAOs, the ones that are going to be done properly are those that are upgrading the best practices of corporations, right? Corporations had one major flaw for them, which was that they wouldn't have regular votes because they said, you know, they couldn't check who the holders were and they needed to kind of get them for a general meeting. And so what ended up happening is you ended up having governors and boards that had absolute power in a way. And what is wonderful about a Web3 kind of governance structure is we can have anonymity while also having a bearer stock, right? We can check who the voter is. And we have this platform like Discord where we can actually have these robust discussions. And so what that has allowed us to do and what's been working for Crown Capital and what we're bringing to Fat Cats is this notion of let's elect a competent board, in our case called the Council of Claw, but let's make anything that is not time sensitive have to go to the entire DAO. So electing the council, number one, uh, deciding on distributions, should we be reinvesting money or should we be giving out some distributions and that we do with a simple claims contract, no gimmicky ponzonomic coins with us. Um, not to say that there aren't great ERG-20 tokens, but most of them coming out are just kind of following a fad. Uh, and if we're going to make our own token, there better be a damn good reason. So with us, it will be a claims contract. Um, and then anything that, again, isn't time sensitive. So what allocation goes to the big caps? What allocation goes to the mid caps? What allocation goes to the small caps? Uh, and then along those same lines, um, you know, when we're voting on, let's say, buying a Macy or Gajira or Cybercongs, when we give the council a mandate, anything that's time sensitive, we have to give them a mandate that they can actually use. So it's not enough to just tell them the price range they can buy. We also have to give them the ability to, you know, deal with market arbitrations or things that happen in the market, right? Because you can be very bullish in a project long term, but it would just be stupid to just hold for, for whatever reason when the market is tanking or you see the market overreacting on, on the upside as well. So we will be giving... Uh, the council, you know, generalized mandates to balance the books if they see necessary, but with but after voting already on the allocations and what we should actually be buying into. Yeah, that's see, that's interesting because like the, when you explain your background and then you explain like what you're doing with this, it gives a lot more, you know, I guess uh, gives you actually some ground to to stand on, you know, when you talk about these kind of things, and it's actually something that this is the kind of people that you want to be doing a, a DAO, you know, because I, in all honesty, I don't really know like. I don't know if you said this before, but is there any projects that you feel like are actually a successful DAO that do it actually properly, like how it's supposed to be run? Well, I mean, what's a proper DAO is is up for question, right? But I, you know, but I would say, um, I have been I've been morbidly unimpressed, uh, to say yeah. the least. Um, uh, but 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 again, that that that's wonderful for me because you know I have never made money being an innovator. I've made money investing in innovators, right? You know, my my clan, the value investors, we're all about searching for the best and 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 partnering with them and helping them go the long way and asking them the tough questions. But I'm not an innovator. You know, when I started Fat Cats, I knew that this would be a grindy process. I mean, we've been building this community for three and a half months because. No, whether whether I, you know, the fact that I'm excited about it, and I think a lot of our community are excited about this project, doesn't change the fact that it's not a high project. We're basically selling premium toilet paper. And so I focused on, you know, building a, trans, focusing on transparency, excellence, and professionalism, because so much of that is lacking. But, be, but that then gives me a market entry, right? If I can kind of use all of my skill set and experience to create something the market needs, I mean, fantastic. You know, it's like, I, I remember when we were 
started, firstly, it was a bull market. So people were like, you know, all my friends were like, yes, yes, Dylan, you know, if you want us to put some money in, we will because we trust you. But the reality is we're making four or five X in everything we touch. And then comes January and they're like, oh, shit, my bags really can go to zero. But in the same time period, Macy went from six ETH to 25 ETH and only retracted to 18 ETH. I mean, by any metric, that's an extraordinary profit, right? So that's when people started taking us a lot more seriously um, and, and realizing that, you know, novelty is important. We should be looking for the novel projects, but also we need to start kind of building out the, you know, the, the builders, right? The, the projects that are doing kind of the, the day in and day out important work, if you will. And, you know, when, when, when people would say, but what, what's your novel angle? My novel angle is that we're not idiots. In a, in, a, in a way. I mean, I, I hate to say it like that, but you know, if you go to, if someone were to tell you that they come from a town which only has one bank, you would laugh at them, right? I mean, it means they're, they're, they're somewhere in Hicksville, right? I mean, they're in the middle of nowhere, right? No one expects a robust, sophisticated market to only have one bank, right? We're seeing this with alpha groups now. We're seeing this token-gated communities. We're seeing this with sniping bot tools. We don't only want one because you want the free market to be robust. The fact that there were so many kind of shitty gimmicky DAOs, I mean, I'll call them out because, you know, when I was looking to invest, uh, I looked at what was available and there were really three options available to us. Either we went the fractionized route, which everyone had already agreed was going to die because we were in the age of utility, right? No one wants to chop up a bored ape like you would the Mona Lisa because it, it screws up your ability to use it, to get the free drops, to claim your tokens. It just doesn't make sense. On the other end of the spectrum was kind of the very, you know, classic coin approach, which is what ApeDAO did. Great. Everything's good on paper, but no one knew who they were, right? You, they were not able to stay relevant in the news cycle because they didn't kind of have a profile pick and brand ambassadors and partnerships going on. And so ApeDAO, they had 30 million in board apes under management, and yet their coin was at eight bucks instead of 16 bucks, and they dissolved the DAO. And so I, then I looked at the profile picture communities and I was horrified. I mean, there was Billionaire, Coyote Cartel, Mutant Cats and Zombie Cats. I mean, I, I, I don't know, it was made by gamblers. I mean, that's the only way to put it. I mean, the amount of gimmicks in that, uh, you know, kind of masquerading as some kind of, of fund, it, it was just a bit of a joke. And, and, and then you top that off by the fact that their teams basically uh, went, in, went into haters and just went to sleep. Uh, it was just a travesty. So, but again, a travesty is an opportunity. I did have to deal with the FUD, right? I had to kind of clear the, 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 burnt, the burnt earth already there because people were like, well, we've tried this shit and it didn't work. No, they fucked it up. There's nothing wrong with the concept, right? Gov good governance has been with us since the Greeks. And fund of funds and hedge funds and good financial products have been with us for hundreds of years. That's not the problem. The problem is the idiots who are steering the car. Ooh, zero cool's actually speechless for a change wow yeah, i mean well i mean dude you i mean you're the one of the only few people i can hear that just holds their own so nicely and it's like uh okay yeah i mean i don't really have anything to critique on that you're making some really good points and, and not even just that like i really enjoy this ama because it's not just like you know you're learning about fat cats but we're also like there's like learning a lot about like everything like art and like the space and all of this and these are the kind of like amas that i actually really like because it's more like a podcast but it is an ama kind of like molded into one so i'm gonna just, i'm honestly over here just like learning <laughs> alongside everyone else that's in the crowd and i really appreciate uh you know these in-depth like you know explanations and and stuff because most people would just be like yeah it's a dow uh, that's our roadmap cool and then you're, you know you're actually explaining it and i really do appreciate that so my apologies for not having too much to add but i love it no, it's great I, I'm, I'm happy i'm happy to hear that i think you and i take our names very seriously too you know john carlo uh, you know adding to that kind of level one in addition to the council of claw i wanted to make sure that we didn't just turn into a cult of dylan or an echo chamber uh, and so we have you know, I think with the, you know, oh, we've got something novel, by the way, on our roadmap, Zero Cool. I think we're the <laughs> first project to have independent advisors to our governing committee and not to the project. So John, Carlo and Brett are advisors to the Council of Claw. So whenever they put forward formal proposals on investments, uh, their job is to kind of fud it and put forward the pros and cons and what we know and what we don't know. 
So uh, we're the first project that John Carla even agreed to kind of be an advisor to. Uh, and uh, pretty much, you know, it took him six weeks to agree because, you know, he takes his name very, very seriously. And he's like, don't fuck this up for me, Dylan, man. I mean, you know, you know, I, I my, you know, I, you know, because he, he once posted, you know, any any founder that's happy to take 800K and ruin their name obviously doesn't believe in the longevity of NFTs. Right. And anyone who really believes in the longevity of NFTs, our name is far more important than some quick dollars and cents. I mean, just look at that founder of Azuki. The fact that he's not doxxed means that he can maybe pull it off again and we can get into that if you want. But, you know, for anyone who, who would have done that three rugs and is doxxed, and I hope someone does find out who he is. Let's see. Uh, you know, that, that's the end. Right. Like Gao Yosef, who, who did Crypto Bulls. I hope yeah. he never gets hired again. I hope he never gets hired again. I, I really do. I, I, I can't, I can't, I can't even get it even started on that. You'll get, you'll, 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 you just hit a trigger for me that that whole situation yeah. with that 3D art meta that came through and, you know, he just came through and was just like, oh, it's Critables. Okay, cool. We're going to release the second collection, release the second collection. During that whole entire thing, he released the Meta Eagles, charged an absorbent amount of money for Meta Eagles with a stupid roadmap, just absolute crap. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he knows Justin Bieber's Eric. He knows Justin Bieber's. Oh, so be sorry. Okay. never mind. I'll, I'm just going to shut my mouth then. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Bieber Justin Bieber is an eight. It's going to be fine. It's it's going to be okay, friend. It's going to be okay. But yeah, so that's how we've kind of structured it from uh, from that point of view. Now, I would say the second two parts of our roadmap, we get into the more the philosophical and the, maybe the esoteric. Uh, so on the philosophical front, we have that we're building a premier business club and think tank. Um, and I say it like that, not just because I've got the snooty accent, but because, you know, we're more than alpha, right? I love the alpha communities, as I said to so many of the degen communities. We're not asking you to be so gentrified that you stop doing your degen plays. Keep doing your degen plays. But what are you going to do with all of that extra money you keep making, right? How are you dividing your portfolio? Surely you want to put some of your money into more long-term plays. You know, and then they start all nodding their head because many of them own a mutant that they'll never sell. Many of them own a cyberkongs they'll never sell, right? They, they treat other communities differently than kind of that one community that they really believe in. And, and that's what we're saying to them, you know. Uh, but, but why we're more than Alpha is Alpha is great. We've got partnerships with a number of Alpha communities. Uh, we've got this locked Discord now as well, and I could get into why. But yeah, Alpha is great. Whitelist Marketplace are great. But we're also focusing heavily on AMAs. Uh, long form conversations. We have people sitting in our cafe 12 to 14 hours a day now, just kind of going through thought pieces, trying to trying to understand where this is all going and what we can do with all of this information. Uh, and we also have uh, a lot of kind of education coming in as well and different tools to really kind of, as I say, create that critical mass of robust debate, right? I'm a free speech maximalist and I think good ideas win out. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's the approach we're going. So, um, yeah, I like to think we're a, you know, a founders club, think tank, business lounge. Uh, we have, I think, over 174 founders now uh, and partnership managers and things just hanging out in Fat Cats. We've had to give them their own lounge uh, because, you know, when that networking all happens, right, Zero? I mean, this is such a small space still that if you build out your circle of competence, you get all the info sooner and you can help kind of steal the direction away from things like squiggles and Pixelmon. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And like you were saying, it's like, it's funny how big and uh, gig how gigantic the space is with so many different projects. But sometimes when you get into this, like, and I think it's a good thing. It's a smart thing when you start seeing like some of the, uh, what I call for lack of a better term, like the good guys, you know, going and you start seeing them and more servers, you know, that you're kind of doing it correctly. You're, you know, you're uh, f you know, not following people, but you're like, your research is proper. And I always get this thing where people are all, always saying, oh, well, Zero, Zero Cool, you're everywhere. And I'm just like, no, you're just actually choosing the correct places to be right now, you know? So it's like, uh, it's definitely a really cool thing. And like you were saying is that it's, um, you know, you got people just like hanging out. And I think that the, the connections that you form is the biggest alpha is networking. I always say is king. It's, it, it is like the true alpha. It's like when you, it's impossible for you to know everything about all projects. It's literally impossible. But what you can do is surround yourself with people who like, you know, spend times in other servers and you can talk to them and you can provide them information. And then, you know, links get linked up you know, like I, how did we get linked up? I was in an AMA. I was listening to your rug pool finder AMA, um, your podcast and, uh, Pearl came to me and s sent me a message, tagged me in Godzilla, said like, Hey, I saw you in there, blah, blah, blah. Like, did you like to link up with Dylan? It was just like really interesting. Like the way the connections are forged 
and the the friendships are forged and it's like such an important part it's like one of my favorite things connecting and talking to people and some people that i have never met or i may never meet in real life i have longer conversations with than like some of my real life friends it's absolutely incredible yeah and for those building projects over here if they're making you fill out a form you're not part of the network just let's just give kind of the hard truth my friends yeah if they make if you're having to go through the form process uh, that's okay. You're doing it right, but you're not part of that network yet. You know, <laughs> it's just the hard truth, right? Because it, it it's it, there is this kind of closed club of competence, but it's a good thing too, right? Because this is the only way we, as the free market, kind of police ourselves without requiring government, right? The free market is amoral. If we keep allowing hapes and pixelmons and squiggles to come through, that's on us in a way, right? I'm not victim blaming by no means. You know, no one deserves to be wrecked. But we could have all done more. You know, it's like, why did the emperor's new clothes only become a situation after hate revealed? You know, yeah. everyone saw some of the art before. You know, why did the influencers only call it out afterwards? And, you know, one thing that happened to me is, you know, very early on as I was starting to build Fat Cats, uh, I was telling friends for five weeks not to not to mince squiggles. I said it's a it's a it's there's a derivative should never have got this big. Uh, it's a massive violation. Doodles has a war chest bigger than you can imagine. I, they've got a great legal team. This is not going to fly, everyone. Don't do it. Uh, and 12 hours before the mint, my personal Twitter account was closed. And I, I went into a funk for three days. And I remember coming out of it and thinking, you know what? Screw this. I'm not going to spend my time talking about the shit. I'm rather going to build a circle of competence and focus on, on the good people, the builders, you know, and partnering with those people. And so, you know, we've championed a few underdogs. I mean, we've got a long-term partnership now with, I think, 16 different groups, one of them being inventors who didn't do well on their mint. But that, that doesn't mean that their content isn't good. They're yeah. giving us great webhooks. They're inviting our community to fantastic education seminars for free. Uh, you know, there's another one called Community Managers Guild, which is a very small little group, but they are working on best practices for community managers and moderators. Fantastic. They are going to be doing a, a module for us to help all of our members kind of, you know, fulfill best practices. We're speaking to another one, um, you know, a friend of mine called Dudette, who's helping us create kind of, you know, competent Zen dens. You know, maybe we can do virtual retreats and stuff like that so that everyone can kind of have their padded, padded little walls, rooms to kind of shake out some of the toxicity over here so anything we can do uh to leverage our network and community and give people as much stuff as possible is brilliant and i think you know most people cannot stay active in more than three to five discords anymore right many of the gajira members who are listening today come from an era you know of march last year where there were so few projects coming out at a time now it's you know there's more in a week than there were in a month or sometimes you know in two months and you just cannot be everywhere. You may be in 200 discords, but you're not hanging out in 200 discords. You've picked a few that you really believe in. Uh, and so I think that, you know, it's incumbent upon communities uh, to really do as much as possible to keep their members engaged. And, you know, I think of it like going to a Hilton business lounge, right? You need quality Wi-Fi. You need great magazines. Uh, you need kind of a good ambiance, maybe some drinks, maybe some laughs. And uh, that's kind of what we're trying to build in Fat Cats. And, you know, after speaking to Ryan Carson, who's doing his gigawatt fund now, I realized that we're kind of all token gating based on different criteria. And for us, Fat Cats is about token gating um, based on competency, not on, on people's net worth. Uh, and so we've kind of got this hybrid lock discord now. We are going to use WAP to token gate that people who bought a Fat Cat from the open market can come in. But other than that, you can only come in either being invited by kind of the green people, so founders and stuff like that, or people who are fat cat holders. And we feel like that way you kind of get that business lounge golf club situation whereby no one goes to a golf club for the first time and doesn't know what golf is or they'll get hit in the head with a ball. But at the same time, just because someone didn't have the money to buy a fat cat, if they're able to contribute and talk and add interesting stuff to our general chat, to that kind of critical mass ecosystem of free speech, we want them there irrespective. And we'll give them lots of free stuff to come and spend their time with us. So that's kind of how we're looking at token gating. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that sounds great. I mean, like, uh, I just wanted to, add, like, you know, hop in and let, unless you want to kind of talk a little bit more about it. I was just kind of curious about like, how, how are you guys going to show the, you know, the, I think that one of the things that projects suffer from is their lack of transparency. 
and transparency is, uh, is you know there is a fine line you can be a little bit too transparent or whatnot but i think that there's a fine line where you need to be a certain amount of transparent because it's like we're giving all this money to you know you guys and we're you know investing and it's like sometimes when i give money i'm just like oh, okay cool like what are you guys doing with my money so i'm curious like how are you going to kind of like you know broadcast or like um you know show like what you guys are doing with the funds and all of that stuff and another thing is is that like you know, how are you guys going to are you uh, do it where like, you know, people don't use what you guys are investing in to kind of like help pad their bags or use people as like exit liquidity and whatnot? Let me answer the first question and then just kind of explain the second one to me again. But I'm, I love that you asked that. No one's asked that question. Um, you know, because of being a lifelong value investor, I've watched, you know, people praising Warren Buffett and yet not doing what he's doing, right? You know, Warren Buffett is described in some of the value investor books as investing in golden eagles sitting in the open, right? Like everyone knows about the Coca-Colas and stuff he's investing in. And yet they're like, you know, because of their mandates from their mutual funds and stuff, they just pass it by. Everyone knows about blue chips, right? We're not kind of preaching uh, something new. And so there's really no reason for us not to be transparent. Uh, we're going to have everything clearly on the website, updated with prices. People will be able to see kind of where the cash reserves are, what our long-term holdings are. People were able to be to to know what we're kind of going to voting on distributing wise and stuff like that. So really, very much full transparency with the money. Uh, if people again want to go and look into the light paper on the governance, but basically we will have a multi sig. We are also talking to Kirobo about their vault, vault technology, but for now we'll be using Gnosis safes. And everything will be held by the Dow multi-sig uh, so that we kind of don't lose the utility, right? So that we don't have the problem uh, of being able to kind of verify ownership and stuff, you know, uh, and utility of those NFTs. Yeah, that's an amazing answer. Um, that's exactly what I want to, but I'm surprised. It's, it's shocking that no one really asked that because like to me, that seems like such like a, you know, an, an important question to ask, especially like more so like, you know, like with a DAO, you know, it's like one of the most important things. It's like, okay, cool. I'm giving you money. What are you guys doing with it? You're supposed to be investing in stuff. Like, how are you going to be transparent? So I know that what you guys are spending and, you know, taking the funds and doing it is actually something that's worth a damn for lack of a better way of saying it. Um, my second part yeah, of my question, people, go ahead. People do ask a security question, interestingly enough, Zero. They, yeah. they do want to ask like how many signatures are required and stuff like that. But what they a lot of them have not asked is a transparency one. I think I think a lot of them look a lot of them are good DJs anyway. They can track wallets, right? It's not that hard. But I think it's interesting. But the fact that they sh that people have got used to having to go do their sniff their own sniff kind of research as opposed to just being given it to them, you know, beautifully as an interface on a website is is the surprising part. Yeah, exactly. Um, and like the the one thing that I off the multi sig thing is I have to ask is so. If there's a chance, if there's a time where, say, we're just using this example, I'm not saying this is what you're investing in, but say, like, it. what? No, I was saying go for it. Go yeah, for it. You yeah, can yeah. ask so the like, So, like, Azuki, <laughs> let's just pretend, like, the Azuki thing, Azuki thing is happening, and you want to, as Fat Cats Dow, you want to purchase some Azukis. I'm not saying this is financial advice or anything like that. I'm just talking about that I'll get to the, what, why, like, this question is asked. Because on a multi sig wallet, you know, the problem is, is that if you – have multiple people from different time zones and you have to get something that's uh time sensitive and you're trying to buy and even sell something that's time sensitive you know because often oftentimes there could be a pump happening and you need to list something into that to make good money um how are you going to get around that kind of stuff how many signatures are needed for a transaction to go through and what kind of like what are you looking at the time zones as far as like where the people are great 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 question so Firstly, we need three of the five signatories, but that doesn't mean that we won't give uh, certain directors individual mandates, right? So if we are watching a market and we think kind of something is going on, uh, we can grant an individual mandate to a governor. Okay. In other words, the, the main thing is that, the, the, that all the funds, right, the bigger, larger funds, uh, kind of to mitigate risks, the bulk has to be sitting in the multi-sig. But if there's one or two things that we think may be a play, uh, you know, we definitely, that's part of the mandate. We can entrust it to one of the governors. This is why the council has to do their KYCs, right? Yeah. They do not have to publicly dox. In Crown Capital, they've all publicly doxed. But for Fat Cats, because we want to encourage people coming from the community, they, they have to do KYCs with the rest of us. So the rest of the council knows who they are so we can track them down to the corners of the earth and, you know, feed them there, whatever.
Yeah, because like that's like one some because like I'm a I'm a one of the signees on the multi sig wallet for Project Gajira, and so that's one of the things that I like. You know, I probably wouldn't be able to ask these questions as well as I am if I wasn't one of the uh, signees on it, and so that's where that comes from. Because I notice even like you know claiming an airdrop, you know, you have to si have people sign. You know, every little thing that you do, you have to sign, and it sometimes yeah. can get a little bit cumbersome. Um, just because like, uh, you know, like, you know, the amount of people, time zones, and one of the things with Gajira is like, you know, we only have 43 people here, but what the th thing is, is that we, you can't ever find a good time for Gajira because the time zones are all over the place. So when, when I, uh, record these on YouTube and I put them on there, I get, you know, hundreds of, of views and it's same thing with the multi -stick. I swear, like uh, Shan's on there. So he lives 15 hours ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> he may, basically lives in the future and then I'm, you know, 15 hours of bath and then we have people like all along there and I feel like sometimes it's kind of like hard to get on the same page to be able to do that. You want to have a conversation and then the time has passed and then you like, you know, like for instance, like I was saying we want to buy doodles when they're, if, if it ever goes under 15 and this was like a couple weeks ago and I was like, that's a, a buy thing and we couldn't really get people together quick enough to be able to buy the doodles and then guess what? Those, the ones that went under 15, they got sold and then doodles ran up to like over 20 or something and we kind of you know miss the boat but we're all learning and trying to like grow together um to you know become better people of you know controlling the the vault and whatnot so it's definitely some interesting yeah stuff. I, I, yeah the, no these are these are great questions this is the the trade-off right the trade-off game and and this is something that the dao has to vote on as as a group because they have to we we need them to give kind of the stamp of approval on what their risk tolerance is right and in a situation like this you know we've we've already been given a plug pass uh, so that we can kind of give, get automatic sniping bots. We've already been given a fresh drops. Uh, you know, our friends have been giving us lots of goodies to help us on our way. But the question then is, do we give a certain council member a mandate, uh, you know, or give them each a certain kind of allowance to fulfill a mandate uh, and vice versa, right? Like, you know, because the selling is the easier part, right? Like if we want to leave out an open sell order, that's fine. If we want to leave an open buy order, that's fine. But the reaction to a market thing like a Zuki, where we, you know, no one saw that coming, right? That was a, you know, no one saw that coming unless they were the people kind of going after him. That's something that someone needs to be holding that a Zuki or be able to get access to it, uh, you know, to, to do something with it. And so some of those cases we will miss because we will prioritize security over um, uh, ease. But sometimes I think we can have a lot of the measures in place uh, to, to react quickly. Yeah. Um, I, I want to touch on one thing we didn't touch on. You know, I, I mentioned that kind of we're selling here to gold miners. Oh, John, Car <laughs> John, Car you know, I say the term gold miners and John Carla DMs me. But, um, you know, I'm selling gold to gold <laughs> miners over here because, you know, I, why, why I'm laughing is it was a, the first time I used that phrase was when I was talking to Midnight Labs. And, you know, there was all these kind of crypto punks sitting in the audience. And I'm like, I know we're raising pretty much less money than each of you have in your own capacity. But hear me out. You know, in addition to a community whale kind of having a community wallet, the benefit of a community whale is we're fucking scary to founders. You know, I love that fact. I love the fact that, I mean, I'm also working for WGMI, so I've got multiple voices. But we all know very well that, you know, a lot of these kind of communities, you know, don't really have to worry about one whale bitching, right? Like just because they have 10 of your assets doesn't mean, you know, they can do much harm. But if they ignore kind of fat cats asking legitimate questions, that can heavily cause them FUD. And so what I like to say sometimes is, if you really believe in what we're building in fat cats, whether it's significant money to you or not, uh, there is a reason, and, and whether you buy a fat cat or not, there's a reason to be supporting projects like ours because we're going to help with excellence and professionalism in, in the space, right? You know, part of the reason why it's so hard to make good business decisions is there really is a lack of data, right? I cannot you know, do uh, the level of analytics on so many of the projects in the space that I can on a stock, right? We don't yet have those reporting requirements and stuff like that. And so we need to help build out that investor relations uh, kind of uh, team, you know, and, and that kind of uh, dialogue between uh, established teams and, and those who are their investors. So... So what you just touched on is actually something that I was going to ask, um, you know, what I ask a lot of projects is, you know, if you guys mint out and you guys are just get su successful and your project gets rolling, how, um, this is like one of the biggest things in the space is like, how is, how are you going to better this space? 
you know like if you're successful like what how is your project being successful going to be a good addition to the nft space as a whole because people need to start thinking outside the project or outside the box which is their own project and you got to think outside that and the reason why i say that is because you know like i was telling you before is that if we don't start like thinking about everybody like you know the space as a whole instead of just your own project then guess what's going to happen you know it's just it just it's just all about people just you know money 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 and then all of a sudden the the bubble's going to burst and if we like start to think more proactively about bettering the space as being a successful project then i feel like it's going to be a lot better this whole meta of just having you know oh want to announce our big collab you know what is a collab really Collab's a whitelist trade, you know? It's just you're given whitelist spots. But and I understand this can't be for everybody, but there's gotta be more to it. There's gotta be some more banding together because you can have like everyone's project can be successful. You know, no one's gonna be bored eight, but it doesn't matter. You your project's still successful if you're selling over mint and you have a good community and you're still building. That's a successful project, you know? And so like what you were just touching on, bringing that professionalism and, you know, the transparency and like the full, you know, this doxing and all of that stuff, bringing that and bringing more projects like that and kind of maybe, cause there's no, there's no way of, you know, really educating and teaching people this space. There's, you can't go to college for NFTs, you know? <laughs> That's what I always tell people. So we're all learning and growing together. And so we don't really have a, you know, a standard, you know, a gold standard for how a project should be. That's why we have so many rug pulls and that's why we have some that are really amazing and that's why we have some that are in between. But that's the big thing is that we need something more to have people be like a benchmark for what you need to achieve. And when I say that, it's like what you were saying is the professionalism. There is a real lack of professionalism with a lot of these projects that are coming out. And this is this is the stuff we're having. You know, like we're having the Suzuki stuff, we're having the Pixelmon stuff. And I, I will be the first to admit, one of the things that I will say is, I own up to my fuck ups and one of my fuck ups was I was all in being like Pixelmon is amazing and all this stuff and guess what I got caught up in the hype and I'm the first to admit that that was like a stupid thing and guess what you want to know what is really important about quote unquote failures is that your failures are actually your biggest uh, lessons that you can learn from and it's arguable that your failures are actually more beneficial to your your like the future of you and you growing in this space than your successes are because you know if you're going yeah. through and you only succeed all the time you get this idea like yeah this is easy and then when you do that and then you have something that is a road bump or a hiccup then all of a sudden you get derailed and you don't know what to do so i'm not saying that everyone needs to get like involved in a rug pull or have that happen but it's part of like the growing and the learning in the space and I think that professionalism, as funny as it sounds, would you ever invest in a company that were just profile pictures or that don't have real names that are like, you know, I miss, I miss Legends, all, gamer names, right? you know, no one would do that. Yeah. No one would do yeah. that. And then we come to this NFT space and people are just like, oh, man, that guy's got an ape as his thing. Cool. Yeah, yeah let me put like, I trust him. You know, it's like yeah. it's like one of the things and, I, and I've and i been victim to this, too. And I'm not even going to say, like, I'll own up to my shit. And that's what I always tell my girlfriend is that, like, I know I fucked up, but at least I'm owning up to it. Can you give me some credit? <laughs> so I'll at least yeah. like take responsibility for it. And that's the thing is that, like, people even alpha alpha callers will look and be like, oh, board ape yacht club people are doing this. Like, you want to know, for instance, like you mentioned before, tripsters, you know? They had a bunch of board ape yacht club people behind it, so it was immediately it was it was trusted, you know, trusted, I, quote unquote. I, I interviewed them and I found like I just I don't know it it felt uh, it felt like I was in a gym with like four alpha dudes showing me how big their biceps were. It was Ugh. the weirdest AMA. I mean, it was like oh man, you know they they kind of like pumping the LA. We've got Lambos. You'll have a Lambo too one day. It was just. Oh, it was yeah. it, it was not nice it was not nice and you know the only I, i'll tell you a story i think I, I i don't think i've actually ever told this to fat cat members although he has something new um i avoided pixelmon and i avoided pixelmon because uh i had avoided bernie madoff you know and i remember when i was still in private banking a client asked me to look into bernie madoff and we tried to get in contact with the team and the team just wouldn't give us any information and i remember saying back to my client I literally can't give you a, a yes or a no because we can't get, we cannot get any info out of the team. And, um, and that story, you know, really got crystallized in my mind because I remember arriving in Manhattan one morning and I had all these meetings. I'd, I, I'm sorry, it was the night before and I went to bed and I remember kind of getting up that morning and I was staying at this kind of like diva friend of ours and she goes, hello, darling, come eat breakfast. And I said, I've got to rush. I've got these meetings. She goes, no, darling, I don't think you do. And she throws me the paper. 
And there Bernie Madoff is being arrested. She goes, I'm sure, darling, all your meetings have been cancelled, sweetheart. Come eat some breakfast. And I remember rushing out the door because I was only two blocks away from Bernie Madoff and, and, and the whole street was cordoned off. And that is stuck in my mind. I was this young 20-something at the time. Uh, and it was like, wow, you know, uh, there, there is, you, you cannot, there, you, you cannot change the rules, right? You know, and so when I say to my community, you know, we're interviewing, we've interviewed, I think, 74 founders just for Fat Cats Cafe. And I, I think it's now something like 55 or 57 for WGMI. That's how you get kind of at least some idea of if this team is low energy, high energy, uh, cash grabby, inspired, passionate. You need to hear them talking about their project because that's going to give you a real window into is this guy a, a snake oil salesman? Does he believe in NFTs? You know, what's the plans? And if you don't kind of pull that back, these marketing teams are going to bamboozle you because they know how to write all the right words on their websites. Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of like why, like what you were just saying is uh, uh, when I, whenever I have AMAs and I've probably done maybe 40, 50 or so um, since I've been, you know, doing this, you know, doing the AMAs in particular. And I, I think that's like an important thing, like you were just saying is like, you can read these white papers, but like the white paper is, you know, it's, um, it's scripted, obviously, you know, they have time to think about it, to write their sentences out, to make things perfect, to make sure they're not skewing things the way they don't want it to be. But like when a founder actually comes up and it actually tells you about the project, you get a really like it almost like brings it to life, you know, and you can actually feel like the passion and like how much they like really know about their project. As funny as it is, as some projects founders don't really know like they should know every single thing the ins and outs of every single little thing about it and like you were just saying is yeah, yeah. like you, you they need to be able to do that and i think it's like one of the best ways for me to intro that's why i kind of introed you is because like we can read these white papers but when you actually hear people talk about it you can you just like a whole new layer of like understanding and like you're learning from like what they actually are all about you know it's very telling yeah exactly and you touched on one other point that i want to bring up is, you know, I think, you know, I had a number of kind of like humbling moments throughout this whole process. I mean, the first was Giancarlo agreeing to be part of the team. I think the next was Doodles Alpha arriving because Doodles Alpha kind of asked for whitelist spots when we only had like 700 people on our Discord. You know, it was like yeah. very, very humbling. Uh, and then I think the, 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 the third most humbling thing was that, you know, both for Gajira and for CyberKongs, we met up through the partnership departments, not the collaboration departments, right? And those funny words, right? We call whitelist collaborations. But, you know, the, the fact that we all got into each other ra other's radar about partnerships was the exciting part to me because I think, you know, so many people like to flex how many board ape holders they have in their server. We like to flex how many founders are there, you know, because I think that shows the truth, the truth of our network. And a lot of those founders and, and partner managers are already talking to each other and doing great deals, right? We've built out something of value to the greater NFT space. But also I think that the meta right now is partnership. And what makes Fat Cats such a kind of such a good, unique situation is because we're selling premium toilet paper, we're literally not offensive to anyone, right? No one wanted to do what we're doing. No one wants to copy us. We're not sexy. And so we're able to be kind of the goat. We're hosting all of these inter-community poker tournaments every week. We've got a 36 Metaverse platform embassy set up already via Council of Kings. TCG World just gave us land, um, you know, because everyone realizes that, look, we can integrate them into games. We can give them a legendary in our art. We can kind of pull them into AMAs as thought leaders and stuff like that because it's, they're not going to steal our members. You know, on the contrary, it's a stamp of approval uh, to have them ask us the tough questions. So that has been wonderful. Uh, you know, we've got Chainlink on already on board, you know, doing things with us. We've got Certic on that, that helps us with a lot of connections. So it's just been a wonderful, wonderful thing to be able to build out these partnerships. And I think that that is correct, like you're saying, Zirical. Anyone is just thinking myopically, right? Anyone is not talking in terms of, you know, how can we get as much value to the two communities' collective holders? How can we get them integrated into as many things as possible? Or even yet what we used to say two months ago, you know, we when 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 everything started happening, like the first John Carla videos, it's like, you know, your your fat cat or your Gajira is supposed to be, you know, a passport, right? Like a black credit card for chase, you know, it's supposed to open doors for you. And people stop talking in those terms. I haven't. 
I mean, that's still the biggest utility, right? Like if we can leverage our network or our community to get people to get our holders massive discounts or access, not just whitelist spots, but, you know, first access to games or special characters uh, or, or embassies or kind of keep us in the news cycle. That's really, really, really valuable. Yeah, exactly. It's uh yeah, it's definitely something you make a good point. I never even stopped to think about that though. Like it's kind of like people just don't really yeah, talk like that anymore, but I do feel feel like that's one of the things that that made me go from, you know, cuz like I told you before, I collected street art and uh, you know, actual like real life tangible art on paper, and I of course someone who does that a lot when you look at how much JPEGs are selling for, you know, some of these pixel projects, that's all it is, is just the JPEG is selling more than my, uh, uh, one of my, my biggest and most expensive things in my collection is an original by a really famous Chinese street artist. And it just like blew my mind and I was totally turned off by it. And the thing that got me to be less turned off by it was what you were saying. It's like, you know, owning this is basically like, you know, kind of like a, for people in the United States, like a Costco membership, you can scan your uh, NFT and you can get in and you have access to be able to buy certain things, uh, you know, be a part of certain communities. And like you're, and like you said, it's, it's just kind of like be a black card, like to access and to unlock certain avenues that you didn't have before. Dylan. <laughs> so there, Dylan, you're muted. Ah, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ah, <laughs> I'm talking to myself. You know, one of the things that really <laughs> concerned me when I spoke to an influencer recently about blue chips, he's like, yeah, I consider blue chips to be anything above teen ETH. And I just, <laughs> he lost so much grace in my eyes at that point. I mean, I'll give him a bit of a benefit of doubt because he's, he's just 20 and he's just getting started here. Uh, and I, you know, some of the young guys are brilliant, but I mean, that was really an ignorant comment you know, I felt because that's just ridiculous, right? The fact that everyone is kind of, you know, following each other's lemmings off the cliff to a high floor price doesn't mean something's a blue chip. When I looked at Kajira and CyberKongs and said to my community, why I consider you guys to be so important, it is because you have never stopped building, right? Yeah. I mean, probably Kajira has a, just hired a Chinese uh, a Chinese correspondent to build out your community. Yep. Uh, every time I arrive at a quality games, they're like, we just spoke to Project Kajira. I'm like, oh, well, at least I'm in the right place. I mean, you know, they've already spoken to you guys. So, you know, that's what is important to me. The fact that you guys have never just, you know, I'm, I, I'll, I'll say it, you know, some of the projects like Sneaky Vampire Syndicate have kind of gone to sleep. You know, yeah. it's a pity. It's a pity, but you guys have never gone to sleep and cyberkongs have never gone to sleep. Uh, your, your AMA schedules are so packed because you're so bloody busy looking for those gems and looking to kind of get Kajira integrated wherever you can. So that's stuff I want to see, right? Everything is still 70% team these days. And when I see a team that is not just resting on their kind of, you know, we've arrived, we're already there, guys, we're going to make it, you know, you're not, you have to keep building every day. Really, things are still so new. And those those thrones that people are sitting on, they can be easily dethroned, right? Azuki came out of nowhere, and Azuki has gone back into the ocean uh, out of nowhere. Yeah. And it's like one of those things where, um, you know, people get, like you're saying, it's, people get so wrapped up in this floor price, you know, it's and it almost puts these blinders in. And, and, it, and it makes people kind of like, you know, act differently. And like, you know, it's like we get to a certain floor price and then it's like they take the foot off, foot off the pedal, which that doesn't make sense. You actually need to put the pedal to the metal even more so when you're a higher floor price. But also it's like one of those things where like, you know, if you're not over a certain amount of ETH, your project's not successful. That's actually not true. It just all depends on your community and how much you've been building and people get so wrapped up in like comparing themselves with different projects. And then they kind of pivot off of their roadmap to try to, Oh, we want to be like Llama verse. Oh, we want to be like project Gajira. Oh, they did this. We need to do something like this to do better. But like, no, you just need to be your own damn project and just continuing to build and make the space better. And then when you do that, guess what happens? Your floor price is just, you know, inherently going to go up because of that. Yeah. 
I will say that some projects are built on shitty foundations. I, you know, I, a lot of our community came early on. You know, we got a lot of French people in our community that came from crypto champions. Uh, and I think if you really, you know, part of the problem with these high projects is if you really build with such a hot air balloon and it pops, it's very, very, very difficult to claw your way back up again, right? In other words, I, there was almost, you know, it's, 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 it's a pity that there were a lot of founders thought like we're building for the long term. We really don't intend to rug our members, but what can we do? The hype is the matter. So we better sell them everything and then apologize later and build from there. Very bad approach. Very, very bad approach because I don't think you can come back from that, right? The new cycle moves so fast in the space that if you really get to that point of critical disappointment, I mean, I do not think Azuki can still turn itself around in many ways, yeah. but it can never be the golden child anymore. The stain on its brand is just too remarkable, right? Like Blizzard has never been able to shake off their male chauvinist kind of, you know, uh, team members. So, you know, you have to be very, very careful about kind of a setback versus kind of critical damage. Yeah. I mean, you know, like I think that more people and also another, it's about all about mindset. I think they need to start looking at as these projects as being actual companies and start treating them as such. And there's so many of these practices that they actually do every single day that would never fucking fly, um, you know, on a, you know, like in a normal, on, a, on an actual company, you know, and they need to start thinking about that because, the valuation, you know, you, you have a valuation of your project, you have a floor price and you have your volume and you have like, you know, the, the cumulative of how much, it, you know, the entirety is, is it's worth, the community vault and all this stuff. And it's actually like crazy amounts of money that's like even bigger than some, you know, think about it like a Zuki, CyberCon, like all the big ones, Board Yacht Club, like what they are valuation is, is as expensive, you know, as much, you know, as a, you know, extremely successful company that's been around for 10, 15 years and people need to have that mindset. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Board Ape, Yuga Labs doesn't have to do kind of any filing or like anything yet. They don't, you know, they've got Yuga Labs is brilliant on their branding, but I mean, they they don't have a customer relations department. There's no one to talk to over there, right? I mean, in fact, everyone kept messaging me the last two weeks. Board Ape members were messaging me saying, Dylan, do you know Yuga Labs? Uh, sorry, do you know Animoca Brands? I said, kind of. Like, I mean, can we can we get question answers done by, for Yuga Labs via Animoca? You know, <laughs> people yeah. are going through the back door and it's it's both laughable and sad. And 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 uh, we have to fix that. Right. We have to fix that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know, I'd be loath to not mention the logistics before we kind of, you know, maybe take some questions. But uh, we are still going ahead with our mint on the 18th. Um, we may be a little bit naive. I'm going to be honest over here. Maybe a little bit naive, but I think the combination that Crown Capital is taking a hundred uh, for the for the Dow plus uh, a lot of the whales from Crown Capital wanted kind of between ten to fifty each. Uh, I think we have plus the community we've built up. I think we are minting into the perfect storm. If our utility wasn't that we are focused on buying blue chips. Uh, we would avoid it. Uh, but the fact that we don't have to change our price, which is 0.08 ETH, uh, and that we still are kind of, you know, focusing on blue chips, this really is a perfect market for us. It's a discounted market. That said, we are watching carefully. I mean, if, if board apes go below 80 ETH and Ethereum goes below 2000, uh, I will definitely consider uh, pushing off because we're, we're not really in a rush. We've been building for three and a half months. If we have to go another month, who gives a shit? Right. We, you know, we don't need the money urgently. I know a lot of the members are itchy to kind of let's get that final piece of the pie. Let's get our money going. Let's have our fat cats that we can kind of feel that this is part of our identity now. I get it. I know that. But, you know, part of being a founder is you kind of have to be that father figure. And I have to do what's best for the overall well-being of this community. But as of now, we are minting on May 18th. Uh, the price is 0 0.08 ETH, as I said. Uh, there's a total supply of 5,000. Everyone in the first wave can mint to a total of two. Uh, and then in the second wave, the same people on the whitelist can mint to a total of 10. Uh, the reason we're doing that is we do value unique hold account, but we feel that, you know, between kind of uh, my ability through WGMI and all the press releases we'll have and all of our going entry point into metaverse platforms, we can keep ourselves in the news cycle without kind of obsessing about unique hold account. And we're going to have the junior fat cats as that kind of stock split. So we will be able to get another group of unique hold accounts. So that said, we'd therefore rather have our fat cats in the hands of those who really believe in the project and not some kind of public sniping bot. So round one, everyone come in two. Round two, another 12 hours, the same people in the whitelist come into a total of 10, and then we'll go to the public sale. Okay, that's cool. It sounds great.
um yeah i'm just you know it's just it's hard to understand you know i advise for a couple projects and right now we're i think a lot of people are advising for their different project to maybe push back mint given the current situation and whatnot but i don't think that it's like something that has to be done it sounds like you obviously have done a lot of research and thought like very very hard about this and have uh planned it all out but so like you know that's the question that i always you know i don't hate asking this it's just something that a question that people don't normally like to hear but i know that you probably don't have any problem with answering it but like you know if you don't mint out you know what what are you you gonna do you have capital behind you so it's like i, I it sounds like it was not a big deal you just will have less to work with correct because 70 exactly 70 no, percent goes exactly, exactly exactly i think there's two worst case scenarios and i've been preparing the community actually for this for three weeks i said look I want you to understand, you know, I, I know many of you are not here since the era of board Ape and stuff, but high utility projects like ours or high kind of value projects like ours can take two to three days to mint out. I need you to be prepared for that fact. Point number two is we are definitely not dead in the water. On the contrary, uh, you know, our operational costs are so low, you know, we're not building a game that if we only mint out 60, 70 percent, we're fine. Even if we mint out 50%, we're fine. That's still half a million for us to work with. Maybe we'll have to adjust our focus more to be on the mid caps right now than the big caps. But nothing we're doing can't be fulfilled. Uh, and that gives me a lot of kind of sitting power. In other words, the only failure is kind of the emotional fud that will happen uh, of, you know, oh, they didn't mint out. They're not going to make it. And we'll have to work doubly hard to build that reputation. Uh, but I'm willing to work hard. I've never been scared of working hard. Kind of, you know, when we built this project, as I say, you know, we had this very small community. We've literally ground in every member. This is why our engagement is so high. Uh, you know, we've got, I think, 5,000 something members. I think we have about two and a half active online at pretty much any time. So I think that, you know, we, we, are, we, are, we are breaking all the rules and maybe that makes me a marketing idiot. But I don't know. I just I get to spend time with this community every day. You know, I, I have the singular honor. I think I'm the only founder that's probably uh, got the honor, honor of being ranked number one in their server for most active speaker. I mean, the, the mentors, you know, we have, I think, 38 volunteer mentors and moderators and, and community managers in the server. A fantastic team. I mean, they're just wonderful, been building with us for months. And they joke that, you know, uh, Pills here in the audience, he just did a, a Instagram like, when, when are people online? And he put me online in every time zone. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I'm a workaholic. I, I do have a masseuse on call. In fact, I have two ma masseuses on call. Uh, that's my guilty pleasure and keeps me sane. But I don't know how to not keep building. I, I just, it's, it's what I do. Yeah, and see, that's the kind of that's the kind of people that we need more of in this space. Like, you know, people like like you know, like us. Like, that's kind of been my whole thing. Is I've I came into this space, you know, uh, trying to find a way to make money and to, um, you know, just like do something other than what I had done before. And I was a carpenter before, and I was like, wow, this is cool. Like, this is like you know, art and stuff like that. And so I came into the space thinking, you know, I just want to make money. And then I ended up kind of fully pivoting to a position where. I immersed myself in the th in the space. I dove head first in, you know, like I totally immersed myself. I do this full time now because I'm on the core team at Project Gajira and I do advisory and I do a lot of other stuff helping out. And a lot of the stuff that like I enjoy most, I don't get paid anything for. And I think it's a really important thing for us right now. And the reason why I bring this up is because some people thinking that not minting out is a sign of failure. That's actually a really uneducated mindset, and I'm trying to get people off that. It doesn't actually mean that at all. If you're investing in builders and a project that you like, you know, and it doesn't, you know, mint out, then if you're upset about it, it's because you were trying to flip that. And you were not trying to buy in for the actual utility and the, the actual value and the community and all that stuff. And so, like, I think it's like a really like a shitty mindset for some people to be in is to think that not minting out is a sign of failure. So you just move on. But that's not true. Yeah. There's so many projects that didn't haven't minted out and they're extremely successful. You know, like I'm pretty sure like NFT Worlds was like a free mint and it didn't like mint out immediately. And now look at it, what it does. And, you know, all of the bigger projects, you know, Cool Cats and all those. I don't think they like instantly minted out right away. Obviously, oh, they were. Know they're cool. Yeah. Cool, cool cats at the low their mint price, but yeah. I mean it was a different era, and so people had different expectations. Definitely, that's what I was about to say. Is that's definitely a different era. But then I wanted to also touch on what you were saying about talking the server, and people ask me all the time, "Is like zero cool? Like you know, you look at a lot of projects. Can you tell me what's a like what's were some good indicators that I don't already think of, like to look at a project?" And I was like, "Well, for one thing, go to that, go to the project's Discord, find the founder's name, search their logs, and see how much they're talking. If there are people like yourself that have been in there for like." 
like a couple days or a week that have more messages than the founder. In my opinion, it's a red flag. I'm not saying that it's a red flag for a rug pool, but it's a red flag for a, a, a project that doesn't isn't passionate because, you know, here, I remember Shan would always come into chat and talk a bunch in chat. And I always got really bullish because before Shan, like, I think he ha like had to, he like, so, somehow or another, his his level got reset, but he was always a top five person, and that that always like boded really well for the project. And I always thought that was really cool. And if you can't, if you go to a project, and you can't get a hold of a, a mod, or you can't get a hold of a founder or a team member. In my opinion, that's like that's just not how it should be. It shouldn't be like that. You should be able to get in touch with anybody at, a, at a, like you know, obviously granted, people are busy, but if you go and you send a message, you're trying to talk to the founder, and it takes you know several weeks to get a hold of them or you never get a hold of them, then like, what the hell? Like, why should I give you money? Fuck that. Exactly. You are our investors. We're not allowed to say these words for SEC terms. It's okay. You like investors. We can compare you to investors and we can comparatively say that you should be entitled to the basic standards of an investment investor relations department. And if I do not see a project with a good investor relations department, I tend to be very nervous. You know what else is a terrible indicator for me, Zeroco? Hmm. If I open a ticket somewhere and, and, and it's a simple question and eight people get added to the ticket, uh, then I know that it's a very incompetent governance structure. No one wants to ever be to blame and no one wants to pull the trigger. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely hear that for sure. It's a frustrating thing because it just shouldn't be like that. It's not that difficult for you to give a shit. And if it's, no, if it's that difficult, that, you know, what? Yeah. We, we have to fix that. I mean, it's, yeah, it's yeah. us. You know, this is the Wild West and we, we, you know, we have to build it up. It's on us. Exactly, and if you if it's difficult to do those kind of things, then how do uh, then then uh, you know if it's if it's so difficult to give a shit about your project, then why should I give shit about your project? You know exactly. So it's some of these the things are so simple. You know the messages are simple. The, the things to look for are very simple, and it's like, and it's like it's like that. And I see uh, Scorpion is in there in the chat talking, and he's from the Hypnoducks, and that was one, something that I always really loved about Genesis Projects is that when you go to a Genesis Project and you're building a foundation, it's cool because it's tight knit, and you can actually talk to everybody, and you're actually having conversations with holders while having a conversation with the artist could be there, and the team, and the founders, and that's how it should be at the beginning when you're a Genesis Project, and it should never really like lose that, even when you get bigger and bigger. But it's something that I always like was a really big fan of with like you know Gajira and Hypno ducks and even you know like at the beginning of zooverse and you know all those genesis projects i just really enjoyed being able to come in there and just like you know before people knew who the fuck i was you know because there was a time where people had no idea who it was and i'd come into servers and try to talk and ask these kind of questions and you know i immediately left servers that were just not giving me the time of day it's like it's like oh so like i'm not a big influencer so i don't just my my, my opinion's not valued that that that's a gigantic red flag to me. That's bullshit. I'm as important, if not more important, than those influencers because the influencers come in, they get free whitelists. You know, they're not over there grinding like other people or trying to spend. Uh, you know, grinding's not a good word because you know that's like you know if you find a, a community that you resonate well with, you just want to spend time in the community, and then the you know uh, the added part is that you get a whitelist for hanging out in there because you found somewhere and that's always how it should be it should be a byproduct of spending time and vibing with the project is you get a whitelist and you can mint it you know that's how and, it and speaking be. of that because i know i know some people may need to leave if you do not yet have a cat list for for fat cats and you've been here for an hour and a half please raise your hand I'll take a screenshot and we will kind of give you guys something as well. You open a ticket and we'll get that sorted uh, because, you know, I think we've been very, very careful curating our, our whitelist, our cat list. Uh, I wanted to avoid all of those grindy metrics yeah. that are pretty much obscene. And, you know, we've, we've been saying, you know, we've got a lot of kind of um, uh, cat, uh, fat cat members that come along to all of the AMA circuit. Uh, because they just love learning this info, but I didn't even realize that some of you, know, I just assumed some, they were all on catalyst because if they're this involved, they must be. And, you know, we've got a, uh, one thing we did take from Azuki was the nomination process because we've kind of got 38 different mentors or 36 mentors, I, I have to check. Um, uh, we watch, we, we nominate people all the time. So, you know, that's, we, we're trying to look for the people who are adding value, asking questions, talking. And, you know, if they stump me, they get a catalyst. Hell That's yeah. important. You know, if you stump the founder, you get a catalyst, friend. Good <laughs> questions are not fud. Good questions are the way to grow. We originally were going to give 70% of the royalties to the DAO and 30% to a external team. And then it was like, you know what, this community is so smart and so kind of quality driven that we need to trust the team to pay our salary, the community to pay our salaries. 
And so, you know, we, 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 took, we took a pivot. We, we took the, it was hard work. I had to get on with the artists and everything and say, look, royalties are going the way of the dinosaur. What royalties there are should be going to the community pool and they should be able to vote on those things. So yeah, all right, let me take the screenshot and then you can all raise your, lower your hands. And then I don't know if we've got time uh, for a question or two, up to you, sir. Yeah, I, I don't have anything for another hour or so. I always try to make sure that my, uh, <laughs> yeah, most people try to keep AMAs to a certain, um, you know, a time like sh constraint, but like I like to be able to have, like if we're having a good conversation, then I don't want to stop a good conversation. It's like I'm notorious yeah. for having some of the longest AMAs like in the space. I don't want to, it's not even a bragging. It's just like a, a thing that happened, but I, I can't, myself if i don't have any kind of any place to be or anywhere to go at that time i'll keep my amas going for as long as people are, are staying to learn and to educate themselves and that's what is like really important and i think it's like so 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 important that right now we're at a very interesting like juncture in the you know path of the nft space where i think education it really needs to reign supreme and i do a lot of pro uh, times in here where i do vcs where i'm just literally going through different analytical tools and things like that to try to educate people because, you know, when you're uneducated about the, you know, even just like from Discord safety to token approval safety to open C safety to all of these little things that I don't care how long you've been in this space before, you can always learn more, you know, and if exactly. you act like you are a, the, a pro at this, then you're bullshitting me and I'm, I'm going to laugh at your face because no one's a pro at this. You know, how do you yeah. consider yourself a pro or an analyst or like, you know, anything like that with, with like a space that's only been around for like, you know, a little over a year. I mean, it's been longer, but, you know, it hasn't been, you know, you could almost mark like Bored Ape, like when they minted as kind of being the, the, the real beginning of the, you know, of the NFT space, I guess you could say. Maybe that's not the best indicator, but we, we haven't been around for long, very long is kind of the point I'm trying to make. So. And I just want to say, exactly. so Dylan, that's a very cool thing. I appreciate that, which you come out and that kind of just like makes me a little bit more bullish, just like on the way that you're running. This is just like, you're like, you know, people have been in here hanging out and learning because, you know, we've been partially talking about fat cats and partially just talking about NFT space, like as a whole, and even just like collecting and all that stuff when we were talking about Banksy and, you know, um, so the bees and all that stuff, like Christie's like, you know, the, it's it's important that we have these conversations and I and people should get rewarded for sticking around and learning because I've learned from this and I'm sure you learned some things from this and I can't imagine how much people learn in the audience. And that's why I love doing these AMAs because half the time I'm learning also, you know, I, I you know, I read these white papers, I do research, but I'm also learning a lot and it's not just about um, you know, learning about the project, it's just learning about NFTs and as a whole. And I think it's extremely, extremely important yeah. right now. Lady, ladies and DJs, you can lower your hands unless you do have an actual question. Uh, we took a snapshot. Just do please um, open a ticket after this. Uh, we've sent it to the, to the mentor, so they'll kind of give you your, your catalyst. And, you know, I, I, I agree with that so much, Eureka, because, you know, when you are, you know, we, the whitelist meta came yesterday, right? I mean, you and I are old enough to remember, which is like two months ago, right? That, you know, whitelist only came to solve a problem of bots, right? But now when you're curating your whitelist, surely the whole point should be to get the right people into your project. Again, I don't care if someone flips us for three ETH, no problem. The royalties go to the DAO or use your money, vote with your feet, friends. You know, you know, never going to judge. Some people that serious money, they need to go. You can always stay in the server. We're never going to laugh at you. We, never, we still want you there. None of my fucking business what you do with your money, right? Uh, one of our oldest members in our server has a family situation going on right now. He, he was going to buy 10 now. He's probably not going to buy any. That's what happens, guys. Life happens. But, you know, at the very least, we should be trying to curate our whitelist with the right people that actually have spent a bit of time understanding what the project is about. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, I think we see some questions. No questions. Ah, okay. I, I was um, curious, what, what, um, what made you do, like, why, like, you, know, you mentioned the artists and stuff like that. Why, why fat cats? Just like, as like the subject matter. One second. Did we get Scorpio? Scorpio George. One second. Let's just see that we didn't forget uh, anyone. Is Scorpio George also getting a? Is he there? Yeah. yeah. He's talking okay. To the VC, I'll, yeah. I'll add Scorpio George. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So. Uh, I, I really love DJ culture. I love because I've got a very potty mouth despite the fancy accent. And um, so I, I just love 
DJing culture. And, and, and I also love, you know, pe people and projects who can kind of laugh at themselves, right? And so I wanted to take the piss. I wanted to, you know, it's like, on the one hand, we're coming as this kind of, you know, the new kids on the block. Who are these? Who the fuck are fat cats, right? As someone posted pretty much on when we posted a mind blow and giveaway in a Project PXN. Basically, some of the comments were like, who the fuck are fat cats? And I love that. I mean, that's like we're doing something right. I mean, if you know, it's like Alice, Alice, who the fuck is Alice? And so I, I knew we were the new kids on the block. I knew we weren't a high project. And so I wanted to kind of take the piss and laugh at ourselves. And so for those who don't know, kind of a fat cat in political circles means like a, a businessman or politician or, or lobbyist trying to get their way, trying to get their stuff through. And so I wanted that, that meaning to mean it in the positive sense. We are coming for you founders. We are going to ask those tough questions. We do, you know, we, 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 as much, we're equal opportunity fathers, as we say in Fat Cats, you know, but when we find the project that does seem to be doing everything right, we will champion them to every corner of the earth as well. Uh, and so we want to kind of take the piss at ourselves that we're the nouveau, nouveau money, the new kids on the block, but we also kind of have big intentions. And we also, you know, the Fat Cat pose is that kind of Victorian pose, you know, and a lot of the expressions are these kind of like cheeky, cocky, uh, proud, um, goofy expressions, because we wanted that kind of like, you know, we are proud, not arrogant. Uh, we know we're also in DJ in space. Don't take yourself too seriously, everyone. We're kind of all winging it. Some are winging it better than others. We're all kind of DJs, you know, making millions in our pajamas and boxes. So don't take yourself too seriously. And we wanted an art style that had longevity, right? There's no use saying you're building out for 10 years and having an art style that's just going to be part of the meta right now. Uh, and so we went with this kind of Disney-esque Lion King classic look. Um, in order to kind of have something that had longevity. And we're not attached to it. I love the art, but I know some people in fat cuts are like, eh, art, eh, not my thing, you know, we're, you know, and we're not attached to it. I'm sure that as we do other collections or passes or stuff in the future, we can adjust our art. You know, we have a wonderful ecosystem of artists. Uh, our lead artist comes from the team that's doing all of the animations for Clone X. You know, I really don't talk about our art enough, but we've got this fantastic team and you know she's lovely angie simpson she comes to a lot of our amas too and we're going to host her with some of the other artists soon but uh, she comes from the team of daz 3d and daz 3d are these people that for 12 years have been doing kind of animation work uh, to make everything kind of metaverse metaverse and platform ready and they are the team that are doing all of the animation work for clone x um, and uh, they also created a project called Non-Fungible People. Uh, and so they got us very connected with kind of the, the woman projects, you know, Boss Beauties, World of Women, Crypto Coven and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's amazing working with Angie. She's truly gifted. Uh, and then we brought on Danny Schaubon. This is his first project, but he's a very well-known well -known tattoo artist. And because kind of we had a few artists, I was willing to take a bit of a risk with him because I just I'd never seen anyone do clothing like he did clothing. Right. Like if you go and zoom in on our art because it's kind of 2048 by 2048, you can really have that detail in there. And his texture work is just extraordinary. I mean, have a look at the new Darth Maul one that we just released. That's completely his piece. And, you know, I just, I, I'm so happy that he did it. I mean, there were some rookie things, you know, we, we delayed on time, like our art was probably three weeks late. Plus, I'm, an, I'm, I'm this OCD idiot. I mean, you know, we've got over 2000 traits that have been merged into like 700 and something. And I personally QA'd 38,000 pieces of art uh, into the 5000 collection. So, you know, whatever, I, I, I know my problems, um, but at least, <laughs> at least it's for the benefit of the DAO, because I wanted to make sure that every common was at least presentable, right? Right, that someone would be proud uh, to use that as a profile picture. Uh, so that we took that very seriously. And then our third artist is uh, Patrick Dawson. And he comes from, he's the lead artist for Born to Be Me. Uh, and so, you know, it's just been wonderful having him do some legendaries and helmets and push goals for us. That's amazing. Incredible. <laughs> And, and I think the last aspect that I haven't even talked about is, you know, I'm a, you know, it's funny for a project founded by someone who's a lifelong role player and storyteller. Uh, that is going to be very important for us, but we're going to be using that uh, as extra stuff for the community. You know, Post Mint, uh, firstly, with us, as I say, heavy business lounge and think tank. But secondly, we're also uh, very much about playing games, poker, bonding, building community, getting ourselves into all of these metaverse platforms, but also storytelling. You know, I think we, you know, we, we're building out this kind of space opera. So we've been heavily inspired by Game of Thrones and uh, the Dune universe. Uh, and so we have these four factions, the aristocrats, the, the Order of Hiss, the Syndicate and the Battalion. 
And these four factions are neither good nor bad. They have vying different. They have different interests, right? They have, you know, the syndicate is both the, the respectable business people and the yakuza and mafia kind of people. Uh, you have the the aristocrats. Some of them are very bitter and want to burn the whole empire down, and some of them want to kind of rebuild. And some of them are like, well, you know, let the people have government. Uh, and the only common thing that brings them all together is kind of this love of art and business. Uh, and so we're going to be using that to storytell and build out the world and also use that for kind of friendly rivalry. So, you know, when we do a lot of competitions, it will be faction specific. Uh, when we do uh, maybe, you know, like a lot of roles, maybe the, the ambassadors to the different um, metaverse platforms will come from the Aristocats. Maybe the mentors will all kind of align themselves with the battalion. Maybe the philosophers will all be the order of his. Uh, so we're going to try and work and have fun with that. Yeah, that's... Like I said, your your answers and your responses are very in depth, and it's something that I like really appreciate. And usually, I have a lot of questions to ask on top of it because people don't actually answer the stuff properly. And <laughs> like you said before, you're stumping you're stumping zero cool. I wouldn't say you're stumping me. You're just uh, satisfying with zero cool. <laughs> Well, just stumping. It's just like, oh my yeah. God, you know, two people that never shut up. I mean, you and I love to talk. And so it's like, yeah. wow, he doesn't even, doesn't even have an anecdote, you know? <laughs> so that's, you know. Yeah, I love it. And I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to come out here. I'm not sure if there's anyone else has any questions. Like I said, is uh, oftentimes, you know, if a project's really like good and they do AMAs properly, not very many uh, questions are going to come out. And usually like, uh, if people have tons of questions is because you're not, rep and this is not always necessarily true, but you're not, you're not representing your project properly. Um, and you're not giving all the information. If you have to be asked questions to provoke, to get out the good alpha, then your marketing and what you're trying to get out there is just, you're not, you're not doing it properly. And it's, um, and it's something that's, I think it's really important because <clears throat> I think that's something that really kind of handcuffs some projects that come out there is they're really, really good projects. They just don't know how to represent themselves and to really be able to teach people because some of the stuff is kind of like as simple as it might be to a founder because you've immersed yourself and you talk about it all day. So it's like so duh to you, but to everyday people, even myself, you know, some of the stuff that seems so, um, you know, obvious is, is not necessarily obvious. And I appreciate that you've, you know, there's everything that you've given us, all the details information and just that you know honestly just having an educated discussion which i like actually appreciate so much and i don't often get those with amas because usually i'm just grilling a project and we're, you know nothing else is really coming of it but it's it's you know definitely like i said it's an honor and a pleasure pleasure to have you here dylan i must say well and i can turn that back on you there would have been no crown capital would have never dreamed up the idea of fat cats if we weren't terribly impressed by some of the ogs you yeah. know we got here because you guys got here first and instead of being bitter and saying oh i didn't get to mint a board ape i never it's too late now let me go and try and find the next one and like people do and they all those derivative nonsense that goes on we said how can we become a community whale of individual dolphins and middle class and 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 continue to look uh you know which of these projects are still going to 10x 100x uh, over the next couple of years because they're building such important ecosystems and 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 brands exactly um but yeah i mean if there's anything else that you wanted to uh you know say i know we've been talking for a while but you know and it's been an hour and a half and it might be you know relatively a decent idea to kind of start to uh, find a natural stopping point which i think that we've got there and i don't think that uh, you and i talking is uh this is not the last of it i think that we're going to have a good time. We'll talk on Wagme Studios and we'll bring different projects and we'll just keep in touch. And I think that's like one of those things like, you know, just somehow or another, we just networked and found two like minded individuals that can just talk for hours and hours. And uh, there's only a few people in the space that I've met that are really give me a run for my money for just talking, you know, without needing any contact. And you can just talk forever and it'd actually be worth a damn. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, good. No, I think this is a natural place to end. And, and I definitely, as I said, you know, the part that inspired me about, you know, when you when we got together, and, and the same goes for, you know, word worth for, uh, sorry, word work uh, from from cyber Kongs, I, I may have butchered his name, I'm so right. sorry. But it's that you guys were like, how can we work together, right? Like, 
Forget this gimmicky word collaborations. Whitelists are cool. Let's get you over the finish line. Let's get you minted out. But what can we do ongoing? And that is how I've been looking at things from the start as well. And so, you know, Gojira kind of bangs down the door and NFT Llama bangs down the door. But when we, we're quickly going to be running through the portal. Uh, and so, you know, we're watching what you're doing. Uh, we're watching who you're taking seriously. And we want to be part of those ecosystems too. So, you know, thank you again so much for this. And thank you to everyone who's taken time out of their busy day to listen to this. I know that most people want to be anywhere but NFTs and crypto and the markets right now. So I appreciate you all for, for, for kind of being brave enough to not be ostriches. And uh, yeah, thank you. It's also very telling, you know, with the project is like a lot of people when the, the market's in a downturn, they kind of, you know, pump the brakes and, you know, people who just continue to build and keep on pushing on and persevering is, is definitely very telling of a good foundation for a good project or for good founders or for a good team and just all the way around good community and all that stuff. And I see you've got members of your community out here supporting you. And I always love to see that, um, that you guys bring some of your, you know, your community through. And that's just a, you know, very indicative of like the work that you guys have put on. Yeah. They bring themselves. They bring, they yeah. bring themselves. You, you know what I mean though? You know, it's like, because. Yeah. 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 You, yeah. But, you only, you only no, gave just, them a I little just, bit I, of I, ETH, right? You know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, no, but I like to give them more credit because I, I, you know, I've, I've said to a lot of them, you know, one of the parts about building a project long term is you have to keep building the community because a lot, if, if you do your job right, so many of those members are going to go on to become important people themselves, and they will always be your alma mater. They will come and spend time with you, but maybe not to have enough time to spend anymore. And so you have to keep bringing in the new people. You have to keep building out, you know, who is your active community. Uh, you know, this is kind of one of those sad things that John Carlo noted for me, that, you know, some of the OG communities, because they cross a 4E floor, 5E floor, a lot of the people who kind of built it up it's a lot of money for them. They sell out, but those were also the people talking there every day, creating that very valuable social capital. So, you know, I'm so impressed with some of the people I've met in Fat Cats. I mean, a shout out to all of them that are listening, you know, Parker, Sourcing Things, Pearl, Coop, Nico. I mean, they're all fantastic. Mr. Tushnik, I mean, she's a Don in, a, in a, her own project. And we're just so very lucky that they've, you know, taken the time to, to come and listen to some of these AMAs, but also to build with us. Good stuff, man. Such good stuff, Dylan. Um, yeah, we'll just wrap it up because, you know, sometimes we'll just keep on going around and then all of a sudden we've been talking for 30 more minutes. But to all the Jira fam, to all the Fat Cats fam, um, thank you guys so much for coming in here and, you know, just being a part of it and listening and just, you know, educating. And I always really appreciate those kind of things because, you know, you could just follow the hype and just go and look at those projects but there's all so many good projects that you get blinded by if you only follow hype and you know you'll miss a whole lot of like really amazing founders and people who are really trying to build and make this space better so thank you guys so much um thank you dylan i appreciate you and we will uh talk soon thank you bye